Crush your enemies. They drew first blood, not me. See them driven before you? Oh, my user. And they hear the lamentation of the women. But I pity the fool. Glitter in the dark near the ten hours of gate. Phone home. They're here. Oh, real light sleeper, Charles. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release in the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Das Boot, released February 10th, 1982. It was written and directed by Wolfgang Peterson, based on a novel by Lothar G. Buckheim, and released by New Constantine Film in West Germany and Triumph Films in America. In 1941, novelist Lothar Gunther Buckheim was ordered aboard the 7th patrol of German U-boat U-96 as a photographer and reporter. 22 years later, in 1973, he published a loosely fictionalized account of his adventures during the Battle of the Atlantic entitled Das Boot, told from the perspective of a war correspondent, Lieutenant Werner, playing the author. Several adaptation attempts were mounted right away in the early 70s with producers wooing first Robert Redford, and later Paul Newman, to play Captain Willenbrock. Another name briefly considered was Christopher Walken, and I think that could have been great, because Das Boot was made for Walken. What? He was never considered for the role. <laughs> I just wanted to make that joke. The captain's role was offered eventually to Rutger Hauer, but he wisely turned it down to play the villain of Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. American directors John Sturgis and Don Siegel were both considered briefly to direct, but neither thought it was possible to hold as close to the source material as producers intended. At over $30 million, Das Boot was the most expensive German production to date, thanks to its extreme dedication to realism, including tracking down the original designer of the actual U-boats sent on these patrols for consultation in the recreation of an accurate full-scale interior of the titular boat. Wow, they didn't just have one? There was only one left, and it was a museum piece that they didn't have access to. Wow. Mm. That's crazy. Yeah. So they actually had to build it with the actual blueprints from mm. the guy who designed them in the first place. Huh. But like they didn't have access to it. I, I understand like they They weren't they weren't given access to oh. look at the inside of it. Really? Yeah. That seems They were too worried about it getting damaged because it's in one piece still. So you'd have mm. to go inside to make these determinations. Yeah. So okay, so the guy that wrote the book was a photographer put on the boat. Yep. So did he have a lot of reference imagery to I think go so. off of? Yeah. That'd be pretty cool to yeah. try to recreate that from those pictures. And apparently almost every bolt is accounted for on the inside of this wow. thing. Like th this is very highly accurate recreation. The walkways of the boat are never wider than two outstretched arms, so a condensed version of the standard 35mm Ari camera was designed especially for the film. A full-size Steadicam would have been spatially impossible, but the handheld photography was smoothened with the addition of gyroscopes. The actors were also employed for a full year, with everything shot in sequence so that their beards could be natural and the fatigue could be authentic. The entire cast were bilingual German and English and provided their own characters' voices in the English dub. Technically, both languages are fully dubbed, since there was no room for sound equipment in the film's tight quarters, so the audio was all recorded in post. So you're saying I could have watched the dub version and it would have been just as legit as watching the German version? I can't tell the difference anymore mm. when I watch with subs or dubs. Like, it, if you ask me after the fact, I'd be like, I forget. Oh. It doesn't okay. make a difference to me. Well, my dyslexic brain does not work that way. Yeah. The submodel used for exteriors was an empty shell, and as we mentioned in our review of Raiders, it was rented to Spielberg for use in Raiders of the Lost Ark without the express permission of the filmmakers, who at first thought their incredibly expensive prop had been somehow stolen. What? <laughs> The film was released in West Germany in September of 1981 to record-breaking box office, bringing in over $5 million in just two weeks. An American release was planned for February the following year, 1982. Many more versions have made their debut since then. Part of the film's financing came from the West German government in exchange for broadcast rights to a re-edit of the story formatted as a six-episode miniseries. 50 minutes per episode, so the consequent five-hour miniseries cut has also been granted a Blu-ray release as the original uncut version. But that's not what we watched. So what, which one did we watch? We watched what is called the director's cut. Okay. So in 2010, the director's cut was released. This is the most widely available version presently. 
at a runtime of three hours and 28 minutes, can you tell me the only longer movie that we've covered so far on the show? It was nine minutes longer. Nine minutes longer. Heaven's Gate? That's right. Ah. The author Lothar Gunther Buckheim, while pleased with the technical aspects of the production, took issue with what he perceived as pro-German propaganda and the removal of his more blatantly anti-war arguments from the book. I, I feel like that was pretty pretty in there. Yeah. I feel like with film, you don't have to be as blatant and on the nose because yeah. the whole point is that you're absorbing it through what's going on, whereas in a book, you have to spell things out a little bit. For sure. You're seeing the, the torture that these men right. are going through, and they, they don't want to be there. The film was re-released in America with an English dub, but Das Boot remains the only domestic release to prove more successful in its native tongue explaining why the film is more often referred to as Das Boot than the English translation The Boat in America. But I also feel like the fact that it's in German is part of the flavor of it and, yeah. and, it, yeah. and it paints the story that this is a this is about a German boat. I mean, honestly, that that's one of the things that I like the most about this movie. Now, and I'm not a foreign film connoisseur by any means. Sure. Um, you know, but I really don't like when we take American actors and we put them in these historical, you right. know, dramas and mm. we just pretend like they're suddenly German. Yeah. yeah. You know, sure, Tom Cruise, you could be a German. They're just speaking English. They're, they don't even have an accent. Like, I just, it, it really bothers me. I feel like it takes me out. Whereas this felt so incredibly authentic through and through. Yeah. That is what makes this movie amazing. Yeah, that's great. Das Boot garnered six Academy Award nominations, director, screenplay, cinematography, editing, sound, and sound effects which was more than any previous foreign film, but has since been eclipsed by Life is Beautiful, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and most recently by Netflix's German remake of All Quiet on the Western Front, which landed a whopping nine nominations. Novelist Buckheim composed a sequel novel, Die Festung, The Fortress, in 1995, and together with the first book, it was readapted into a television series in 2018, which ran for four seasons. I watched a little bit of it, and it's not about the same characters from this movie, so... It's not really relevant to this story. I'm I'm probably not going to go into the story of that at all. Which I feel like that's a shame because I think this could do a really great like HBO remake type situation where they they go all out again. I mean, it's again. it's mm -hmm. very it's very well you know produced and and oh, okay, so maybe it's good. It's just not the same. Yeah, story. it's just it's just not the exact same story. Yeah, we open with the pinging of a sonar system over credits and a prologue appears. La Rochelle, France, autumn 1941. Germany's vaunted U-boat fleet, with which Hitler hopes to blockade and starve out Britain, is beginning to suffer its first major setbacks. British freighters are now sailing the Atlantic with stronger and more effective destroyer escorts, inflicting heavy losses on the U-boats. Nevertheless, the German high command orders more and more U-boats with even younger crews into battle from their ports in occupied France. The battle for control of the Atlantic is turning against the Germans. 40,000 German sailors served on U-boats during World War II. 30,000 never returned. German audiences were upset that the German World War II sailors were portrayed so sympathetically and suspected American audiences would be even more outraged. But when this came up on screen that three out of four German sailors died at sea, they stood up and applauded the statistic. Which I feel like is the opposite of what the film mm. is trying to do at that moment. Well, they, sorry, they applauded the statistic of... They were like, yeah, we killed three out, out of four of those oh, Nazis. Oh, oh. They, well, they hadn't watched the movie yet, to be fair. But the point was that most of these guys you killed didn't want to be there either. Yeah. <laughs> and then at the end of the film, after its bombastic yeah. conclusion, it was met with a huge standing ovation, which is either a compliment of the filmmakers mm. or of what's happening Over on at the screen. Very end scene. <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> we cut to a screen filled with green because we're underwater now. With the slow swelling of the score, a German U boat drifts out of the green fog directly toward camera. The miniature we're seeing in this shot, and most other underwater shots, was scaled down to around eight feet long and piloted by a literal diver inside the model. <laughs> he was a veteran film diver with 20 years experience, and he quit three days into the production after oh, no. suffering intense seasickness inside this model <clears throat> boat shell. I, why would you put somebody in that? Because they couldn't pilot it yeah. around it just in the water like that seems like a giant way. metal coffin if you yeah. ask yeah. me. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it could very easily have become one. I, I really hoped it was like a recumbent bicycle inside. <laughs> just that would be great. By the way, your air is attached to that pedal, so keep pedaling. Das Bike. 
Larger exterior models included an 18-foot craft, which was often photographed with action figures standing in for the actors watching the sea above deck. The largest model was a 35-foot model that could actually be remotely piloted. Oh, this reminds me of the, the different models for Raise the Titanic. Do you guys recall the last time we saw a 35-foot <laughs> long model of a sea craft seen surfacing in the Atlantic? Was it Raise the Titanic? That's right! <laughs> And we dip to black for the title Das Boot, German for the boat. We cut to a small dirt road along a coastline as a Mercedes rolls along with three German sailors within. They come to a fourth sailor stumbling drunkenly in the road and singing German drinking songs. The driver, Captain Lieutenant Willenbrock, played by Jürgen Prochnow, recognizes the drunk as their vessel's bosun's mate. Another 30 seconds down the road, 11 more drunk men are blocking it, and unzipping their pants to pee on the passing car. <laughs> and Jurgen Prochnow just flips on the windshield wipers like, all right, we're good here. This is fine. This is just standard operating procedure. Again, Willenbrock claims these men as his own. We cut down the road to a rowdy bar where a woman performs a French musical number on stage. Most of the sailors here are shipping out in the morning. One of the men, Willenbrock's second officer, makes a clumsy attempt at a the flowers are still standing maneuver and sweeps a whole table of dishes and food to the floor before rising panicked to salute his captain. The man the captain is leading around is Lieutenant Werner, a war correspondent, who will be joining them tomorrow to report on the lives of these U-boat operators. Willenbrock orders two beers at the bar, and another sailor approaches to confirm the boat is fully loaded for tomorrow's departure. He also mentions having been harassed as an initiation by some of his fellow men, and Willenbrock assures him they've all been through it. A man takes the stage and raises a toast to Lieutenant Thompson, who can barely stand from drunkenness. On the way to the stage, Thompson steals a large bottle of champagne. At the mic, he wields some backhanded compliments against the failed painter Fuhrer, the military genius who brought them here, but crickets from the audience force a course correction, and Thompson switches targets to Churchill, the cigar-chomping bedwetter, and everyone breathes a sigh of relief. Sometime later, even Lieutenant Werner, their war correspondent, is intoxicated to the point of teetering. Back at the bar, Willenbrock and Thompson lament the harsh lessons these new recruits will soon learn about the truth of war. In the span of 15 seconds, the party escalates way out of control. A single shot follows a sailor sneaking up on the female performer and blasting her with seltzer water. In chasing him around the room, they are destroying railings and lighting fixtures, and suddenly another sailor is discharging his weapon, seemingly at random, but in an insert, we see that his haphazard shots have expertly headshotted the faces and breasts of a Renaissance mural on the walls of the concert hall. <laughs> yeah, I was like, it's like, oh, that's a, that's a pretty good shot. Yeah, I, I think the point of that is supposed to be like, it seems like he's doing it randomly, but he's not. Mm -hmm. He's very good with this gun. Werner seeks shelter from the madness in the restroom and finds Willenbrock struggling to lift an unconscious and foaming at the mouth Thompson from the floor. Werner gets him stood up and we cut to the next day as torpedoes are loaded onto the boat at a munitions depot. This scene was shot at the actual U-boat pens in La Rochelle. Do you guys recall the last time we saw a World War II period film shot at the actual La Rochelle U-boat pens? Raiders. That's right. That's where they stole this boat from. <laughs> it was already there. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand this. They just showed up and started filming? I think they were, they had scouted the area and they were like, we're going to shoot in these pens. And then they came to the production and they were like, hey, are you guys using this boat right now? Or could we give you a bunch of money to use this for a thing we'll get it done in a couple hours and they were like sure and so they floated it out into the harbor to shoot some stuff at sea with the submarine yeah. and, and peterson came back and was like where is das boot it's a pretty important part of the movie last minute repairs are made to captain willenbrock's boat and he welcomes his men aboard he introduces them to war correspondent werner he tells them werner's here to write about heroes and to remember to be heroes people crowd the sub pen to wave goodbye to the departing u-boat and Hungover Thompson arrives last and shouts for them to sink everybody out there. Below deck, Werner photographs the men sorting all the supplies on board. He's given a tour of the claustrophobic interior and led to his own bunk, which is currently covered in bread, but they're they're sorting shit out. Give him mm -hmm. a second. And his bunk is, like, right before the engine room. Right, yeah. Yeah, so it's, like, his bunk along with, like, three others and then door to engine room. Yeah, this will catch on fire first. It's hard to even imagine functioning in such cramped quarters, let alone this crowded with sailors, and for the filmmakers to have somehow found room for a camera and all this madness is just insane. I can't believe the shots they're getting when people are having to run down these hallways. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they're so it's so smooth and so fast. Yeah, it looks really great. I, 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 before you had said that they had 
made a smaller camera with gyros. I thought I just assumed that they had rigged something to the ceiling. Like yeah, they had, like, they wouldn't. They, the he ref- Peterson refused to cut away walls to make any extra mm. room for the camera. It was literally just handheld the entire time. Well, I feel like it has to be like because they you use every inch of this boat in yeah. in, in the shots they're getting. So they but they, the framing is always so beautiful too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every time and and it's not like it's all fish eyed or anything. It's it just looks like someone painstakingly set up a really nice shot every single time. But but it's always framed so elegantly. Even even with such small space to work with. Werner is taken to the engine room where the seemingly mute Johan character smiles to indicate all is well here. Captain Willembrock tells Werner to save some film for the return trip when the men have all grown their sea beards. He seems embarrassed to have been put in charge of so many practical children, improperly warned of the dangers ahead. And he also doesn't want to embarrass British soldiers by making them look at photographs of young mm. men who they sank. He wants them to feel like they were fighting men. Sometime later, we see Werner eating at the officer's table with Willenbrock, the first and second lieutenants, and the chief engineer. The first lieutenant is called away to his first watch and seems quite excited to be doing his part for the nation. The first lieutenant is climbing a ladder out of the boat when a man shouts down the tube with a full alarm and everybody rushes to action. We see the bare asses of sailors interrupted mid-shit to their stations. (laughs) Rudders of (laughs) mid-shit. The boat disappears silently below the surface, and a smile creeps across the captain's face before he confirms this was a drill, but a successful one. Of all the spooked men on board, Lieutenant Werner seems the most terrified. They transition from the dive drill to a test of the boat's depth rating. Men lean in to warn Werner that any miscalculation and they will all be crushed to death by the pressure. Irgendwann ist natürlich Schluss. Ist klar. Hält der Druckkörper nicht mehr. Dann wird das Boot vom Wasserdruck zerquetscht. And I think you said they mentioned 90 meters is the yeah. maximum depth. Mm-hmm. Well, he said that's what it's like safely rated to, which I think makes sense when they show the the, the dial because basically mm-hmm. it's the green, green ends at 90 to yeah. 90, and then you got another yellow, kind of yellow to 180. Yeah. To, yeah, exactly, and then it goes red up to like two. I think 270 is the highest number we see, but yeah, we learn later that so. it goes further than yeah. that. <laughs> the boat is deathly quiet except for the echoing creaks of their reinforced steel coffin. You ever seen footage uh, from people on submarines, like, well, they'll, they'll like, shape, shake up a can of soda? I don't think I have. Yeah, yeah. so, like, on the submarine, they'll, they'll, when they're diving, they'll shake up a can of soda really, like, get it really, and then just open the, the can, and nothing comes out. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> because it's so pressurized because inside. Because it pressurizes so much. <laughs> they dive to about 160 meters before they're satisfied, and then they return to the surface. That night, Werner chats with a young man reading a letter from his pregnant girlfriend. She's French. So it will mean trouble if she intends to have the baby, and she does. We skip forward a bit of time, only noticeable by the appearance of beards around the officer's table. Will and Brock talks through all the standard issue nicknames for Churchill before admitting the man is doing a decent job at least. The first lieutenant promises to end Churchill's legacy. Will and Brock starts referring to his own first lieutenant as a Hitler youth and asks him to put on a celebrated British music record for them all to enjoy. <laughs> the Tipperary song, when ich bitten darf. And, and he reluctantly does it. Yeah, like, I like he follows the order because he knows the chain of command, mm-hmm. but he's clearly pissed off about it. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. Die Platte wird noch ihr Bild anschaulich und da brauche ich Schaden eins wie oben. You guys remember the last couple of times we mentioned Tipperary on the show? Oh man, I remember talking about it. Mm-hmm. What movie was that? A band plays it at an event in another World War adjacent. Yeah. Is it um, The Big Red One? No. It's one of the the runny movies. Oh. Chariots of Fire? No. (laughs) Gallipoli? There you go. But we mentioned it before that because the book adapted into Hitchcock's Frenzy got its title, Goodbye Piccadilly, Farewell Leicester Square, from the popular British music hall piece. One morning, Werner awakens to hear the men making fun of him and his fat ass. Werner is nauseated by the men comparing the food on board to baby shit and toe jam. The chief engineer is doing a crossword puzzle and needs help with some weirdly simple clues, but Werner is more than willing to help him fill in the blanks. The first lieutenant seems annoyed by the apparent stupidity of his cohorts. The men receive a signal about a nearby convoy, and when they map it out, they see that Thompson's boat is moving to handle it, and they're too far to take part in this maneuver. 
Uh, so we also see it uh, in this before that when they're decoding is that they have a, an Enigma machine. Right. And I was trying to get confirmation of the history of at what point were uh, uh, messages being already decoded. decoded and false information being like like where where they're allowing certain vessels to be targeted. That's what the first the season of the DOS boot series is about mm. is that they're confused why – their coordinates are being found so quickly and they, they think that they have a mole or something and they say it's impossible that they're decoding anything because we have the Enigma machine and there's no way right. they could possibly be solving for that yet. Uh, so I know uh, like in the history of the Enigma machine, um, there was a, a later model that had four four gears. Yeah. Um, and this one looked like it had four, so it would have been a later, yeah. more paranoid model of like, <laughs> <laughs> like we need to add another layer of security to this machine. You need the anti kythera mechanism. Yeah, there you go. But that's just for time travel. Oh, okay. The men start greasing up their torpedoes in case they'll need to load them soon, but it's Werner. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Get your minds out of the gutter. Sorry. But as soon as Werner photographs the process, he's hit in the face with a rag drenched in oil. The room goes deadly quiet, and the man in charge of this section demands to know who is responsible. Werner has already suspected the men hate him and storms out of the section in anger. I and, thought it was more embarrassment than anger. Well, he seems upset, like, yeah, well, I, I, it's, with these people specifically. I, I, I got the – well, I got it. Because this is probably just my own my own uh, uh, putting myself into that situation. Yeah. Like, it's like, it's like, I'm really embarrassed, and I'm going to probably start crying, and I'm going to get out of here. I got to get out of here before I cry because it's just going to go – Right under all this oil on my face. In the middle of the night, another alarm is sounded, and the man monitoring the sound around to them reports propeller sounds. Even though the sound is fading, Will and Brock suggests diving a bit to avoid drawing attention, disadvantaged as they are in complete darkness. The next day, the boat surfaces, and we learn that they are about 10 hours from another British convoy that they might take part in attacking. The men are excited to be on a path to contributing to the war effort on the offensive, finally. Unfortunately, the weather worsens on the way, and the complete lack of visibility urges them back underwater. I feel like that's the aspect of this movie that confused me the most, was their eagerness to enter into battle. Because a lot of them seem like they didn't really want to be there. But at the same time, they seemed eager to get into battle. And I'd be like, if I had to be in war, I would... It's just me, but I'd be like... That's great if we just never do anything. I, I think that the logic for a lot of them is that worse than being there in the first place would be being there for no reason. Maybe. They would like to be serving a purpose or like if I got called into work and they didn't ask me to do anything all day and then they told me to go home, I'd actually be kind of pissed off about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be okay. like, there was nothing to fucking Fair, do. And, but- and it's like work came down finally, like halfway through my shift, I'd be like, Thank fucking God I didn't come in for no reason. But if that work had a high likelihood, a, 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 a three-fourths chance of killing you Even every better. time. <laughs> Please, God, give me something interesting to do at work. Yeah, I'm sure I could fix this grenade for you, Jen. <laughs> yeah, you just got to put the pin back in. <laughs> do you have it? I'm sure this pin will work. Patrick, that's a pen. <laughs> Sounds enough like pin. <laughs> <laughs> the man monitoring audio calls Will and Brock to the headphones, and it sounds like the convoy is attacking another U-boat with depth charges in the barely audible distance. Will and Brock orders the boat to surface. The weather is still shit, even when they're within sight of the convoy, and by the time they get it in their binoculars, they see it's not a freighter at all, but a destroyer heading straight for them. The boat takes a steep dive, but they raise periscope one last time to check the destroyer's bearing. Men take their battle stations in case the new plan is to take out a full destroyer on their own. Unfortunately, the destroyer is headed directly for them. Will and Brock orders four torpedoes loaded. Impossibly, they lose sight of the ship, and by the time they find it again, it's already upon them. They barely dive quick enough to avoid a collision, and the boat is rocked with a barrage of depth charges. These explosions were created by recording underwater explosives at 1,500 frames per second mm. to get that cool yeah, yeah, bubble yeah. explosion. I think they do a very similar thing in U571. That movie, like, I mean, I obviously thought about that movie a lot when right. I watched this movie because I had never seen 
to us boot before, but I saw U571 when it came out in theaters. It's great. And that was an experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I kind of wish that I had seen this. I don't know if the sound is as good in this movie because I had to watch it almost on mute because people are always sleeping right. when I try to watch these movies. But, and in um, general, people are always fucking sleeping. <laughs> people are always sleeping. You sleep every day? Jesus. But like, you know, and obviously I don't have a theater surround sound here, but I'm hoping that the sound was as good in this movie because yeah. U571, like, I feel like that movie was built on the sound experience of being in a sub. Yeah. Unfortunately, the U-boat was spotted by the mere presence of their periscope above the water. Several bulbs burst and the men are injured, but the boat takes no permanent damage and the men freeze in shock afterward. The radio man says the propellers aren't getting louder or quieter. The destroyer is keeping pace barely ahead of them. The destroyer circles back and hits them with another batch of depth charges and again, the damage is superficial and the boat survives the onslaught. The destroyer is coming back for round three when Willenbrock orders silent running and a deep dive. The destroyer passes over them and a third and more devastating round of depth charges erupt around them. This time they begin taking on water, but they're quick to crank shut any busted seams to minimize the leak. The hull is still preserved, and the destroyer appears to be looping back over them again, probably in search of debris. This time, though, they pass directly over the boat without dropping a payload. The destroyer continues on its way. The depth charges can be heard in the distance, indicating the destroyer has lost sight of them. An hour later, they seem in the clear, but Willenbrock orders them not to surface before dark in case the British are waiting them out. The silent running thing is really fascinating to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, Have you ever seen the movie Silent Running? No, I haven't. Oh, wait. There's Run Silent Run Deep. I'm thinking of Run Silent Run Deep. Sil- you have seen Silent Running. That's the one where... Uh, oh, that's, <laughs> that's not a Bruce submarine Bruce Dern is movie. obsessed that's with his space movie. plants in space. I have seen that one. Yeah. But um, uh, Run Silent Run Deep with, uh, with Clark Gable. Uh, is really great, and they do a lot of silent running in that. I don't, I like, I, I just, it baffles me that, that like, you literally have to, like, stop talking. Because mm-hmm. these boats the literally had microphones mm-hmm. built into them that Which they would so listen crazy. to the submarines. And, and that you could hear all of that happening under yeah. the water. And you can't have Harlan Williams making whale sounds for right, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or farting in your oxygen tube. <laughs> oh, that's a different uh, movie. That's a different one. Was that McHale's Navy where he's uh, the whale uh, down Periscope? Down Periscope, which is the movie I was thinking of more yeah. than Me Five Seven One. <laughs> down Periscope is exactly like Das Boot. Same difference. You know, what, you know what? I was gonna bring up later, but I'll bring it up now. They do a lot of the same stuff. Yeah. Like, so they he taps. The first thing he does is he tests the depth. Yeah. And blows bolts off of things. Right. Uh, they run aground on the seafloor. Uh, yeah, so they, they do like a lot of... That's a of, lot of, uh, of specific dust boot jokes. Exactly. Yeah. I, I don't know why I always confused Mc, McHale's Navy and uh, Down Periscope. Oh, well, Down Periscope is a superior movie in my opinion. Is it, Which one has Kelsey Grammer? Down Periscope. Okay, yeah. It, is it a parody movie? It's a... I yeah, think... it's just a straight out submarine comedy. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. But that's... it's not a parody, yeah. It's, oh, it's just a comedy. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a comedy, but it's... It, yeah. It's it's nice. It, it's I mean, obviously, those elements that he was describing are are at least a loose parody of Das Boot. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay. But it's not like a scary movie version of a submarine movie. Yeah. Yeah. Mikhail's Navy was obviously a remake of the TV show. Right. Yeah. They raise the periscope and take a look around, but there's nothing to see here. We cut right to a party on board celebrating their survival, and one of the sailors wearing a bikini and a pair of oranges on a string around his neck to emulate breasts is dancing a classic Josephine Baker Charleston to a live performance of My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. Do you guys recall the last time we had a Josephine Baker performance on the show? I don't. I feel like I could make ragtime. I don't know. No, it's a movie that the soundtrack makes use of a lot of, like, old stock music. Pennies from Heaven? No. (laughs) It's like half and half stock music and brand new music from the composer of the film whose brother directed it. I have no idea. Forbidden Zone. Oh. 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 There's a scene in the beginning when Frenchie goes to sing in front of the class, and she sings a Josephine Baker song, specifically La Petite Tonquinoise. This scene in particular upset the source material novelist Lothar G. Buckheim the most, because he insisted no German soldier would ever have behaved this way, dressing as a woman and dancing so silly. He's like, no, they didn't do that. We didn't have senses of humor in World <laughs> War II. 
A sailor interrupts the party to announce that Germany's team is losing the World Cup 5-0. But it's funny because at first it sounds like they've got some, like, terrible news about the war, the war. effort. Yeah, yeah. He's like, our team is losing 5-0. And you're like, oh, shit, they sunk five subs. And then you're like, oh, he's literally talking about the fucking soccer team. And they're all acting like their friends died. Yeah. We cut to the boat doctor diagnosing a sailor with crabs as everybody laughs. Ugh. And we cut right from that to the officer's table where everyone is eating some disgusting looking hairy food. What is this? It's pig. It's just, yeah, it's just pig meat. It's but just, they didn't. They didn't shave it didn't, and cut the skin off. Ugh. So you just eat the pig. You just got to eat Fernal. it from the correct side. Ugh. The hair is just to hold on to. I mean, I'm Keep a your little. Grip. I'm a little confused about preservation of food on this ship to begin with. Because mm. they're there for months and months. Mm -hmm. And they obviously don't have any refrigeration on this thing. I would imagine that all their meat should be cured or dried and not hunks of fresh pig Why side. is the hair growing still? It doesn't grow. The skin shrinks. Oh, okay. That makes sense. <laughs> well, but there's, they're also eating ice cream. So they must have had some kind of semblance of a of Are a they eating cold... ice cream? Aren't they? I don't remember. Oh, I, I thought that in, in one scene that they, they the officers were all, they were eating something out of a bowl. And you can see there were cherries and it was some kind of like clear, like whitish substance. I assumed it could have been some kind of pudding, I suppose. I assumed yeah. it was a, some kind or of Or a meringue cream. kind of situation, something mm. that you can whip up. Yeah. yeah. But but my point about the the hair was more that it's like, it looked like that when they brought it on board, right? So it's not like this food is hairy because it's old. It's like, no, that was hairy when mm. you brought it. Yeah. On the ship. It was hairy day one. Maybe it's just to show the quality of meat that they were getting. Ugh. Like Maybe. that this is the best they could get. And that's what the officers ate. Yeah. Yeah, the other guys are just eating just the hair that fell off of this piece. The chief engineer suggests that their food could use a shave before pointing out another crab infestation in the eyebrows of the first lieutenant. I, I feel like that's just life on a submarine. I yeah. feel like you should pre treat all these guys for a bunch yeah. of like common things just like Say, okay, guys, we're going to have crabs. That's it. <laughs> just send them all through, just like whatever they're dusting their crotches with mm -hmm. here. Just... Crotch dusting. <laughs> yeah, the crotch <laughs> dusting. Do that before they get on the boat. Everyone, I, I do like the moment, though, a good crotch dust. when the doctor is like, hey, dude, I think it's crabs. Because it's like, you know, in the real world, this would happen with you and your doctor in the privacy of like a room at the hospital. Right, right. But here it's happening in a room with 60 other dudes that are all <laughs> looking directly at your junk while he tells you. Mm -hmm. When the lieutenant gets to the doctor, there's a whole line of dudes with their asses out waiting for the same diagnosis. In another bad storm, the boat is constantly thrown from side to side for hours, and we see the men getting scrambled inside. One of the sailors suggests diving to calmer water so they don't waste so much fuel fighting the waves. The radio man Heinrich worries about traveling at that depth, but Willenbrock assures him that German U-boats are the world's best. Surfacing again, they are struck by several large waves, and one of the men, Pilgrim, is wiped overboard, or very nearly overboard. He's caught up in some of the boat's railing, and the men are able to wrestle him back below deck. They spend a lot of time up in this little... I don't know what the area of the like ship is called. Like a crow's nest type Yeah, area. but the, the part that goes above water yeah. first when they mm -hmm. surface and the hatch opens up. And I'm like, I didn't realize that that you all just stand there getting bashed by waves in order to and navigate the ship. And then they just jump ship. full strength down the tube into yeah. the ship all the time too. You must have a really good system for pumping all of that water I mean, there's the there's pumps all over that ship. Sorry, it's not a ship. It's a boat. There's... There's pumps das all boat. over the boat. All over Das Boat. <laughs> There's pumps all over Das Boat. <laughs> During the filming of this rescue, one of the actors actually slipped and fell against this railing, suffering the same multiple broken rib injury oh. attributed to the Pilgrim character in the story. Pilgrim is very bloody, and eventually they determine he cracked three ribs and tore a big gash in his head, hence all the blood. The second lieutenant is digging through a loaf of bread at the table, and it's dark green in the middle. He claims mildew is good for you, but thankfully he doesn't eat any of it right here in the scene. The next day, they're surfaced again when they cross paths with another U-boat. They send signals to the boat with a spotlight and learn this is their friend Thompson. Above deck, Willenbrock is excited to see his friend, but below he's infuriated that a fleet of merely 12 boats would be stationed so close together in the Atlantic. He and the navigator worry together that because of the bad weather, they are mixed up and off course. Yeah, so uh, I was trying to look up uh, get a clear idea of what they use for navigation, um, and they use like they use sun a sextant and yeah, so yeah, exactly. They they 
They use the sun and they use uh, the stars at but they, night. But they couldn't see the stars in this storm. Correct. Yeah. He, they, they have been they, – they have had bad weather for two weeks. So they said that they – we haven't seen the sun in two weeks. We don't even know. This is the best guess based on engine speed uh, and, you know, dead reckoning. Yeah, basically. Um, but they also showed something and I was, and I was kind of curious about it when I saw it. But I'm wondering if it was part of navigation is that they cut to it. There's a, there's a clock. And it's a 12-hour clock. Um, and I'm like, well, what, what time would that clock be set to if you're traveling around the Atlantic going east and west? Because you're crossing all sorts of time zones. Yes. Yeah, and so uh, what early navigation – Sea time. Well, well, early navigation, what they would do is like you would have a clock. You have two clocks. You have one set to the port that you left. And then you take daily readings and make adjustments to the other clock based on the day. And that tells you how far east and west you are. Yeah. Inside every man, there are two wolves. <laughs> Inside every boat, there are two clocks. That night, they finally get a brief peek at the sky to try and place themselves on a map. Will and Brock orders torpedoes loaded and full speed ahead. They spot a convoy of British ships. The boat and a convoy destroyer exchange fire. The boat dives immediately, and the men wait for their torpedoes to make contact. If they miss, the destroyer will chase them forever. Fortunately, all three torpedoes hit their marks, and the men listen as the ship collapses and sinks past them. From the other sound clues under the water, Willenbrock determines that the enemy is firing in the wrong direction at first, but then they hear propellers approaching. Another batch of depth charges are dumped onto them. The men check the boat for damage and determine a fracture in the air shaft. Another blast cracks open a seam, dumping water into the boat, and an electrical fire starts in a hallway. They're able to douse the flames within about 15 seconds, but they've taken much more damage this round than ever before. Will and Brock suspects the enemy is dead set on avenging their sunken craft. After a moment's silence, the sonar is pinging again, and the captain orders them deeper and deeper. The men are more and more terrified as the boat descends to new record depths. 210 meters, 220 meters, 230 meters. The bolts begin busting from the bulkhead and tearing through the cabin like bullets, occasionally striking sailors, but still Will and Brock orders silence and depth. Run silent, run deep. It's crazy to me that... Like, any one, two, three of these isn't just a catastrophic failure. Well, the things that we see popping off are not actually bracketing the hull at all. So any of these bolts that you see that are firing around are for interior pipes and stuff like that. Because they specifically didn't use rivets on the exterior of the ship for that reason. It was all flat panels and welds. It wasn't oh, okay. riveting. Interesting. So these things are popping off because the pressure in these particular pipes, the differential is like changing too fast between yeah. inside. A, lo a lot of these are the pumps that are supposed to keep the water out of the ship. Um, but they also help to pressurize the in the interior so that these men aren't crushed anyway. And uh, as the pressure is getting higher and higher, they're forced to work harder and harder until these, these little bolts are buckling off of them. Yeah, because th the idea that you can just like keep fixing this thing while you're going deeper just seemed so impossible to me. Yeah. Another depth charge sets the walls to blasting and Will and Brock orders them back up to 150. The captain screams for damage reports and learns the engine room is flooding. The exploding bolts have sheared the gaskets sealing the compartment. The captain assures his men that the destroyer can't have any more depth charges left to drop. The various flooding compartments are successfully sealed. Johan appears looking terrified and when the captain orders him back to the engine room, he speaks his first words in the film. They have to tackle him to the floor to restrain him. As another series of blasts rock the boat, the men are shaken violently about, but Willenbrock seems rooted to the floor by his sheer anger at what's going on around him. Werner crawls back into his bunk and passes out, clutching the photo from his home life before this mission. Hours later, he awakens, surprised to be alive, and creeps around the boat to survey the damage. And most everyone else seems to be sleeping as well. So so when Johan's having his freak out, yeah. Captain goes away, mm. and they tackle him to the ground and drag him back. Captain comes back with a gun. Yeah. Yep. Like they were going to shoot him yep. for disobeying orders mm. or for freaking out i guess and putting everyone in danger yeah yeah like if if they need to be quiet and he's f having a flip out like at one gonna, point we're gonna he, have a mash moment here where mm. we're just like shut up but he also sure. at one point goes for the ladder mm -hmm. like he's gonna climb up and out while they're 220 230 meters underwater right not that he would have been able to open that 
from the direction that he was going, but the fact that he was like not even in his right head enough to know that I can't get out of this submarine right now. Right. But if you ask me what are the worst places in the world to fire a gun, I think inside a submarine yeah. at depth might be one of them. But there's already bullets flying around all over the place right now. Yeah, but like, I mean, you better hope that it doesn't pass through this guy and yeah. into your hull, right? You got to shoot him in the thickest part. I suppose if depth charges aren't breaking through this hull, a bullet's probably not either. I mean, it would it still fuck people up. You want to hit the guy you're aiming Bounce for. Bounce around in the yeah, yeah. ship. The few conscious sailors tally and report the damages to the boat, and the captain says they'll surface in around 10 minutes. He turns to Werner and brags that just as he predicted, they have survived the assault. We cut to the boat surfacing in a still and blood-red sea. I vividly recall the first time seeing the film that I assumed the rest of this was about Nazis on a submarine in hell, because, in fact, they did not survive the night. Like, I thought, oh, it must have collapsed in the middle of the night, because it looks like hell where mm-hmm. they come up above the water. Above the surface, Willenbrock and his men observe a flaming shipwreck being towed away by tugboat. The enemy craft seems one torpedo hit from irreparable, and the captain orders the job finished. They wait ten or so insufferable seconds until the torpedo strikes the ship dead on and a tower of flames rise to the sky. On closer inspection, they see that in the six hours since their initial attack, no Allied ships have come to collect the sailors from this failing vessel, and they pour out of it, now engulfed in flames and diving overboard, praying for rescue. Which is crazy, because that destroyer was, like, zooming around back and forth chasing these guys. You could have saved some of your men. Willenbrock is infuriated to learn that any nation would abandon their navy this way. The men in the water, with no other hope of survival, swim desperately for the U-boat firing on them, and Willenbrock orders a quick retreat since they can't possibly hope to transport prisoners in their condition. The flaming ship on the horizon finally disappears into the water. I don't know why he would waste a torpedo on this. Because if they tow it away, they can fix it and use it mm. again. Eh, it didn't look... No, like, it did not look like it, it was like a, a quick polish. But I think the only reason they would bother tugging it would be But these to fix boats it. had like, you know... A, a dozen, you know, torpedoes or so, right? Yeah. So, like, you've already used Honestly, the three. faster you use them up, sinking ships verifiably, the sooner you can go home. I guess. Or but at I'm, least go somewhere, you yeah, know, where you have allies that you can. Well, and, and this was just one of the ships that they hit because they, they, they shot at other ships. Yeah, because they hit a destroyer here in this same convoy because they heard the bulkhead erupt when, as it was sinking past them in the water. Below deck, the captain learns of another approaching convoy and a planned attack. It's five hours from here, so they have no chance of contributing to this operation either. Later, Willenbrock is composing his captain's log, and upon mentioning the men abandoned at sea, he sits back, seeming to rethink the decision. Johan stops by the captain's quarters to beg for his forgiveness for his temporary insanity. Johan has learned he is due for court-martial. Willenbrock asks how many patrols he's been on, And when Johan reminds him that he's dutifully served on nine patrols now, but he was driven truly mad by the attack yesterday. The captain agrees to forego the court-martial and excuses Johan to sleep. Johan really picked the best moment to ask for forgiveness here (laughs) because the captain is so guilt-plagued after sending all those men to their sea deaths. Willem Brock scribbles another line in his log suggesting an intent to return to Rochelle. The men are obviously ecstatic to be headed home, but the captain warns they might not have enough fuel on board to even get there. Hours later, the captain addresses the men over the speaker system with a disheartening update. Rochelle is officially not an option, and they will instead stop at an Italian naval base, La Spezia, to resupply and then back to sea. The crew are enraged to see their family Christmases dashed, because they all thought they'd be home in time for the holiday. Mm -hmm. Back in the bunks, Werner tries to console a sailor, disappointed by the change of plans. Werner mentions that he and the chief engineer are being discharged from the operation in Italy, and that he can deliver mail for the soldier if he would like. Werner mentions that he and the chief engineer are being discharged from this operation, and that he can deliver the mail for the sailor if he would like. The sailor has a fat stack of letters all bundled together ready to go. We see the U-boat surface in Vigo Harbor, Spain that night. They are seeking a German merchant ship called SS Weiser, carrying the supplies they're here for, torpedoes, fuel, etc. But they have to do this kind of discreetly. Because yeah. they're not supposed to be trading supplies right. from, from this location. Yeah, Spain Spain is technically neutral. Yeah. When they reach their contact, Willenbrock orders the officers up to the SS Weiser, where they are welcomed by a handful of finely dressed officers to a very fancy dining room. 
Because he is always clean-shaven in full regalia, the first lieutenant is mistakenly greeted as the captain. But he also walked right past Willenbrock up to the awaiting contingent, yeah. which even to a layman like me seemed like the wrong move. Like, you can't just walk up and shake hands with somebody before the captain does. The full team are greeted as the heroes of the deep, and word of their successful operation has impressed the higher-ups. Everyone but Willenbrock seems happy to be there, but the captain seems to consider the honor undeserved, or maybe he's just disillusioned with the war effort, and wondering if, in the position of the Allied sailors, if his own government would have left them out there for as many hours. The spokesperson of this welcome committee asks what it's like underwater with the enemy overhead, no doubt awaiting some glorified account of their adventure, which the first lieutenant is happy to provide. The festivities are interrupted by a pair of agents from Madrid with orders from Berlin about the next operation of U-96. Along with these documents is a letter, and the captain calls Werner and the chief engineer out for fresh air. It seems the requests for discharge have been denied. The chief is at least happy to know his captain will remain in good hands. Werner is sorry to return Ullman the sailor's bundled letters. The captain discusses their new mission, passing through the Strait of Gibraltar, a narrow channel between the only allied dockyards in the western Mediterranean. Judging from their faces, the men think this is a suicide mission. The plan is to pass through on the surface in pitch black to save fuel and then dive as they pass the enemy patrols. Because the Allied forces don't expect enemies so close, they are all decorated with lit navigation lights making them easier to dodge. Willenbrock seems to notice motion from one of the destroyers and orders a quick course correction. He points out Gibraltar on the horizon. They're close enough now that they will start their dive in about 10 minutes. But suddenly, the alarm is sounding, and a plane flies low overhead, strafing the boat. They delay the dive long enough to bring the captain and navigator down from the top deck. The navigator has been hit and bleeds profusely from a hole through his shoulder. And these are large Airboard. caliber bullets. Yeah, these are yeah. airplane bullets. Willenbrock orders them full speed ahead, still on the surface, hoping to capitalize on the element of surprise, and finally orders a dive before moving below deck. The wheel to instigate a dive is jammed, and they realize they won't have a way to stop this dive. The chief engineer orders the engines stopped and the extra weight jettisoned to kill their momentum. They're down 150 meters and quickly into the red. They've maxed out in the past at 240 and are soon past 200 again. The bolts begin firing around the ship in the 220s, and they just watch helplessly as the boat sinks past the maximum depth of the meter. By some extraordinary luck, the boat strikes a shelf on the floor of the strait, and they are interrupted in their deadly descent. 280 meters down now, and Willenbrock can't believe the boat hasn't imploded. Leaks spring all around, and the torpedo hatch is quickly flooded. Sailors fly around the ship to assess and stem the damage as quickly as they can. It's no easy fix this time. Some compartments are too flooded or too badly damaged to repair. The chief engineer has to wear dive equipment to deliver new battery cells to replace the cracked ones in the pump. Yeah, they find acid in the bilge. Right. So the batteries are leaking into the system. The draining pump with which they would hope to drain the flooding is jammed, but Johan reports that the leaks have all been stopped for now. They try transferring the floodwaters in buckets to the control room bilge from which they should be able to eject it. The captain learns that the compasses and radios are all kaput. They will be flying blind if they can even surface again. They believe their compressed air can serve the double purpose of ejecting the water and regaining buoyancy. As Johann searches for some fruit to eat, he sees many sailors sleeping in their oxygen masks, but not a single verifiable death so far, not even the airstrike perforated navigator, but it's not looking good for him. Sailor Pilgrim rises from the flooded compartment and announces that it seems to be working. The captain wants a look for himself. Below deck, Werner finds the chief engineer not doing well and offers to get him some fruit to get his glucose up before switching to a bottle of apple juice. The chief engineer suggests that the higher-ups knew this was a crazy mission and that it's probably why Willenbrock tried to rush them to Rochelle first. Werner meets with the captain and Willenbrock has lost all hope. They've been down here 15 hours. The men share his disillusionment with the hero worship and nationalism that led them here. The chief engineer appears to report the pump is clear. Water can be ejected and the compasses are repaired. The captain excuses the chief to rest. The crew are informed that the plan is to surface here and things might get ugly when they do. He promises that if they can evade the Allied patrols, he will chart a beeline for La Rochelle and buy each man here half a bottle of beer himself. If nothing else, they've regained the element of surprise since the enemy would have no reason to suspect they'd survive to this descent. The flooded tanks are blown out to sea and the needle of their depth meter doesn't budge. 
We cut back and forth to the men watching the needle, and after a sudden jostle, the boat rights itself and the needle begins to dance, up to 270, 260, etc. The boat eventually surfaces. Fortunately, they seem alone in the scene, not surrounded or under attack for now. The captain climbs up on deck and orders engines to full throttle ahead. Everything whirs to life in the engine room and their escape is officially underway. The captain shouts out loud that the men who sank them the night before are likely sleeping in or celebrating the victory prematurely. During this whole like sequence when they're like jetting across the water, the score really kicks up and yeah. it's the same composer from the never ending story. Right. And it's just like swelling with this Falcor style music. That's funny. And I was just like, oh my God, I can That's hear great. it. U-96 have made it to safety, and by morning, these men are singing Tipperary again on the approach to La Rochelle. The men are greeted by a live band, uniformed officers, and locals tossing flowers to the boat. The navigator has even made it this far, and it seems not a single man was lost in this entire operation. But just as the crew are disembarking, the entire subpen is firebombed by a huge fleet of Allied aircraft. What few men can outrun the explosions in gunfire crawl into the interior of the pen and collapse in a blood-soaked line. Some call hopelessly for the attention of a medic. Werner makes a decision to race back out to the boat, and we see the face of the first confirmed deaths of this story. Johan and the first lieutenant collapsed in the train yard beside the pen. A few steps further, he finds Ullman, presumably still carrying the stack of letters, and finally he locates Captain Willenbrock, still standing, but bleeding from the mouth, which is always filmic shorthand for mortally wounded. He's watching U-96 disappear underwater, presumably with some men still aboard. When it's gone, he collapses to the ground. Werner tries to help, but it's too late. The picture fades to black and the credits roll. The end. Das Boot. But that was three and a half hours. Just yeah, three and a half yeah, hours. Yeah, three yeah. and a half hours. <laughs> this is a really good movie. Yeah, it's great. It's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, it's, it's just, it's well made. It's long. And, and there are definitely parts where it, you feel the length. Um, but, uh, it's just so well crafted. Uh, and, and I mean, just like set wise, I mean, it's just, but, it, but it's so intense. I, I think it's intentional mm. in sort of the way it torments you with the length. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 and I don't mean that in a bad way. I think that you, you have to sort of take the viewer on this journey and make it slightly painful for them to understand that, you know, there is. There is tedium and there is boredom and 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 there's also horrors of, of, of war. And yeah. So like all of those things happen in those three and a half hours, and I don't think you get the same effect if it's you know if it's like a tight ninety minutes. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Tight ninety minutes. It's just not going to happen. Well, I I do think that it it obviously helps the the long term uh, appeal of the film that the point is never the actual politics of. The yeah. country that they're fighting mm -hmm. for. This could, this story could have happened just as easily with an American submarine trying to get somewhere and sinking other ships. Like it, it, it's irrelevant to the actual theme that these are Germans who were doing terrible right. things at the time. Right. And so I think in that way it makes it easier to sympathize with these characters in terms of just their general human interactions with each other and with the world. But also I think it's amazing that he found all of these really intense German faces yeah. for all these people. And and I've seen people from this film in things after. Specifically, uh, Jürgen Prochnow is in a bunch of stuff. But I've, I recognized Johan when we saw him uh, under, you know, in the engine room the first time. But other than those two, I don't recognize these actors from stuff that they did after this movie. Right. And I never had any trouble telling any of them apart. They're yeah. all very unique characters that, like, none of them seem interchangeable. And I think the fact that every single person on this boat was humanized so effectively that I could tell them apart, I knew what they were going to do in a situation. Yeah. Um, Which, th that's that's pretty incredible to me because that is one of my gripes often about war movies. It's like everybody's the same. Everybody's everybody's the mm. same. They're usually always in uniform, and there's no distinguishing characteristics to them, both physically or as a character. Right. And and all of these guys, while, like, having, you know, relatively the same length hair, the same kind of beards, basically, like, I never had any trouble telling them apart. I could tell when it was the chief engineer walking yeah. in. I could tell when it was Ullman. I could tell when it was Pilgrim. I could tell all of these guys apart. And, and part of that is because 
they're built so well in the dialogue that you that you can tell even just from context of what they're talking about or where they are that much dialogue right like it's 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 very succinct in the way it delivers you that information it's why i think that that honestly the english dub seems a little bit like a waste of time for this although I, i can understand your point when you say if you have dyslexia issues with the subtitles and stuff like that but honestly I feel like I could watch this in German without the subtitles and basically get what's happening the yeah. whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For like sure. this could honestly be a silent film and I could still follow the whole story, which is one of the strengths of like just the visuals and the the incredible scale of these action sequences where everything's blasting off the walls and people are just getting rocked side to side crazily and and it's just it's just about an explosion happened. We got to survive it. Now this happened. We got to survive it. It's just survival over and over and over again, but it's it's coming at them from every direction. It's just a really fascinating story. And and it it on, honestly the the visual effects are anachronistically good. Mm. Yeah. I was really I don't want this to come off at it. I was really thrilled with the way the movie ended because I didn't know what they were going to do. Like cuz I right. I had never seen it before and they're sitting at the bottom of this ocean and I'm like I don't think, like, there's 30 minutes left. I don't think that they're going to explode down here. I think they're going to get back up. Yeah. But what do you do with that? And I can't think of yeah. a better... Yeah, you're like, I don't want them to win, but I, I don't want them to lose. I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I can't think of a better ending than to say, great, they make it to their port and they get blown to bits. For the most yeah. part, everybody dies anyways. Because there's because nothing they did wrong. Because mm-hmm. that's war. And these people did these, you know, heroic things and then they just get shot. Yeah. Like that I think that's the best possible way to end this movie. Yeah, because it, we've come to like this captain by the end of it. We want him to succeed. We want him to feel like 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 the success of this mission rested on his actions and that he brought everybody home safe. And yeah. he did. He got everyone to that pen. Most of them were off the boat. I don't know if everybody got off the boat. I actually would have preferred for it to be clear that every single man had gotten off the boat mm. alive. Yeah. And then maybe died in that harbor. See, I, I think for sure that there was somebody on the boat because the uh, the one uh, one character, I, I was, I, I could I could identify the people different, uh, but I I can I got confused on whose name was who. The the one char- my favorite character was I don't know and I don't know his name, but he was the one who was always smiling, like like he 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 was always like the one who was just like yeah I'm jazzed about what we're doing. Uh, are you uh, talking about the redheaded guy? The, yeah. the second lieutenant? Yeah. 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 Like like no matter what like was going on it's like he's like yeah okay. Like, yeah. like he he was always like the upbeat one. Yeah. Um he is the one who's like has the navigator and is like li- helping lift him up the right, tube. Right. Yes, cuz they're trying to get him out first cuz right, they're yeah. like we need to get you um, medical attention. And and it's pretty much as soon as they get him up onto the deck. Yeah, it seemed like it, that barely anybody got off before it. Yeah, starts getting so it was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone, I don't think whatever crew was remaining on the boat yeah. had gotten off. But, but I, I do think it's important to the story that the captain saved these men and got them where they were supposed right. to be, and brought them home to their families, and that what happened to them after his charge through mm-hmm. no fault of his own. was because of what the government was doing. Yeah. Like, yeah. like Germany brought that on themselves and the allied forces were like within the articles of war to be attacking this place because this is where they're sending out all the submarines that are sinking all their convoys. And that this base wasn't uh, protected. Right. Like, like yeah. we're, they didn't we're, have any anti aircraft guns. Yeah, there was nothing like, to prepare like, for this. Yeah, exactly. Where where was all the people who were supposed to be defending this place? Yeah. And it also seems I mean, I don't know if it's a, because of like there was just no budget left for it, or if the point was supposed to be that Germany was losing their grip even on France at the time, mm. that the the people who saw them off to sea, there was a there was a huge crowd of people in this in this uh, at the sub pen and then when they're coming back it kind of looks like a shitty version of it like there's like one fifth as many people when they're coming back and it's kind of like they're like oh those guys they actually survived we didn't think they were going to survive but everybody come out here do a little Mm. dance real quick because we got to see them off the boat make them feel like they got welcomed and you get to see all the scarring on the hull right uh, yeah yeah yeah. like like yeah this ship this ship can't go back out yeah yeah yeah. it's like even if they get orders like you got to go back out. Like yeah. you can't. It's well, I mean, that's what this sub pen is for too, though. Is is they do yeah, the repairs exactly. there. But but yeah, it would this would it would be make more sense to scrap it for parts at this point. But yeah, really wonderful film. Thumbs up. 
Thumbs up for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, up. Do we know where this is going letterboxed? Oh, I forgot to do that. Me too. I didn't. <gasps> for once. For once. You didn't letterbox it? Nope. I don't letterbox any of these. I just have you do it. <laughs> Very clever. Richard, where's this going letterboxed? Uh, I put it in number one. Uh, I, I, I uh, the, puts it above Zoot Suit. Knocks Zoot Suit out of number one. One, one out of 15. Jess, what are you thinking? Okay, so that that was my struggle, is I loved Zoot Suit, like, a lot. And, but th- this is probably a better movie overall, but I could tell you which one I'm going to rewatch and which one I'm not going to rewatch. Yeah, for sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just not going to watch a three-and-a-half-hour war movie again, you know? Like, mm. it's just not going to happen. So I have it in second place after Zoot Suit, and that's out of 15. Uh, I have it in first also. So first out of 15... Das Boot, Zoot Suit. What do you do? Das Boot, Zoot Suit. <laughs> Subtle innuendo. Uh oh, must I'm really be something torn. inside. It's, no, it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard. a hard decision, honestly. I, very I get different it. movies. Yeah, and and obviously like worlds apart from each other in terms of the production and the style of everything. Yeah. But but it's about your connection to them. It's about how you relate to the characters and you relate to the story and and. F- for your list in particular, whether or not you would like to revisit this world. And yeah. so if that means Zoot Suit goes on top, that's where Zoot Suit goes. That is true. Our writer-director here was Wolfgang Peterson. This was a huge breakout film for Peterson, and the success of the American theatrical release paved the way for his work on future successes like Never Ending Story, Enemy Mine, In the Line of Fire, Outbreak, Air Force One, The Perfect Storm, and more recently the Poseidon Adventure remake titled simply Poseidon. The novelist was Lothar G. Buckheim. He has credits on this, the miniseries re-edit, the four-season television sequel series. So it's all Das Boot-related right, stuff. Right. Uh, the music credit goes to Klaus Doldinger. He was reunited with Peterson to score Neverending Story, though the famous titular theme was composed by Giorgio Moroder. Right, the, right. The original, the, the one they sing on Stranger Things and everything. Uh, Doldinger's other work is mostly German titles. I didn't recognize a lot of the titles. The cinematographer here was Joost Vacano. Before this, he'd lit Spetters, and he came back for Never Ending Story, a series of collaborations with Paul Verhoeven, including Robocop, Total Recall, Showgirls, Starship Troopers, and Hollow Man. The editor here was Hans Nickel. He also worked with Peterson Cutting, Enemy Mine, and Shattered, which we really liked. Yeah, Shattered was great. Another classic Wolfgang Peterson film. Jürgen Prochnow played Captain Lieutenant Heinrich Lehmann Willenbrock. This was a breakout role for him. Later, he appears in The Keep, He's Duke Leto Atreides in Lynch's Dune, a role taken over by William Hurt in the miniseries and by Oscar Isaac in the recent reboot. Proch now is also in Beverly Hills Cop 2, Twin Peaks Firewalk With Me. He's Sutter Kane in In the Mouth of Madness, yeah. Judge Griffin in Judge Dredd, and General Raddick in Air Force One. The actual captain that he's playing in the film survived this patrol and actually served as a consultant on the film. The real Willembrock was a consultant for wow. the film. Herbert Gronmeyer played Lieutenant Werner, the war correspondent. He's better known for his work as a musician in Germany, where his fifth and eleventh albums are still the fourth and second best-selling records in the country's history, making him German's most successful music artist by albums sold. Never even heard of him. (laughs) And he's their most famous music person. He also scored Anton Corgin's 2010 film The American, starring George Clooney. Klaus Wenemann played Chief Engineer Fritz Grade, Beyond this, it was all German titles that I was mostly unfamiliar with. Hubertus Bench played the first lieutenant. Not much else I recognized. Martin Semmelrog played the second lieutenant. Much later, he plays an SS Waffenman in Schindler's List. An SS what now? Waffenman. What's a Waffenman? Do you know the Waffenman? I don't. I don't know the Waffenman. He lives on Drury Lane. No. No. Not my gumdrop buttons. What's a Waffenman? It's a Waffen. It's German. It's uh, the soldiers. Oh, okay. Erwin Leader played Johan. He was a peasant in the 93 Three Musketeers, and he played Singe in the Underworld films. Uwe Oxenecht played Chief Boson. I think that's the first guy who's drunk in the middle of the road. He plays Stilgar in the Dune miniseries, the part played by Javier Bardem in the remake. Claude Oliver Rudolph played Ario. He was Colonel Akakovich in The World Is Not Enough. Oliver Stritzel played Schwal. He played a machinist in that Downfall movie about Hitler's last days. Rita Cadillac played Monique. I think that's the girl singing at the uh, bar at the beginning because I don't remember another female <laughs> character. Uh, she was a famous dancer and stripper from Paris's Crazy Horse Cabaret, and this was her final feature film appearance. 
Otto Sander played Philip Thompson. Later, he's Cassiel in Wim Wenders' Wings of Desire and its sequel, Far Away So Close. Gunter Lamprecht played Captain of the Weiser. He previously showed up as Franz Bieberkopf in Berlin Alexanderplatz and Hans Wetzel in Rainer Fassbinder's The Marriage of Maria Braun. Sky Dumont played an officer aboard the Weiser. We saw him first as Prince Amadeo in Lion of the Desert and very recently as Ziegler in Night Crossing. Later, he shows up in both of Dan Curtis's World War miniseries and as Sandor Zavost in Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut. Ulrich Gunther played Erster W. O. Merkel. He was Daggett in Enemy Mine for director Peterson. Hmm. Those are all the credits I have for this one. I think that's everything I have for Das Boot. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find all our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. If you enjoy what we're doing, consider giving us a review on iTunes. I don't think it helps visibility, but it's good for morale. And if you really like the show, maybe you should join our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash vintage video podcast. What's that sound? We got one! That's right, it's a new patron, Perla Rivera. As a $5 patron of the show, Perla now has access to 50 full-size 70s reviews and a hand in choosing next month's film. Patrons are currently choosing between the following 13 titles. Black Eye, The Black Windmill, Chosen Survivors, Daisy Miller, Dirty Mary Crazy Larry, Flesh for Frankenstein, The Holy Mountain, Huckleberry Finn, The Lords of Flatbush, Madhouse, The Mutations, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, and Zandy's Bride for a 50th anniversary review next month. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing One from the Heart, which IMDb describes like so. A couple has a fight after living together five years in Las Vegas. They go out and celebrate 4th of July, each with a new partner. Breakup? Question mark? <laughs> oh, That's how the IMDb summary wow. goes. Okay.